all you have to do is look at uh, an artist like Michelangelo and you can see even both. You can see this personal struggle, fallen nature, aspiring to the divine, but also a full penetration of the culture and the history of the Greek and Roman architecture and art. And he transforms it within a Christian context. I'm Martinu Correa, and you are Off the Coast of Utopia. In this episode, I speak with Donnie McManus, an Irish sculptor, painter, and educator. McManus is founder of the Irish Academy of Figurative Art in Dublin and the Sacred Art School in Florence, Italy. The recording begins partially into the pre-interview talk we were having, with Donny talking about the meaning of beauty. I hope you enjoy. Beauty has the power to pierce the heart and to bring with it truth and goodness. And that essentially is our mission. Like, you know, in a, in a, in a world as relativistic as ours, you know, oh, your truth is different than my truths. Your idea of goodness is different to my idea of goodness. But beauty is somewhere where we can actually come together and agree on what's beautiful. Uh, and this is all done subconsciously. So if you, if you produce beauty, which is founded in truth and goodness, then that will overflow in your work and people will be attracted to the truth that is produced in your work. And subconsciously, they will absorb the goodness, the, good, the truth and goodness that's in the beauty that you produced. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. That, yeah. Those three things, so, beauty, truth, and goodness, have always been tied together, but now they've kind of been separated. But Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's the, I think that's my role as an artist and as a Catholic, is to bring them together. I think that it's what it is. Yeah, just to make, uh, well, we all want to make a masterpiece. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in in uh, the words of Bob Dylan. Uh, but uh, and it's, it's funny because I said that to John uh, the last time uh, we met in Manhattan. He was giving a talk. John who? John Waters. Oh, okay. Uh, he was actually introducing, uh, he was going to do an interview with Soto. You know the Soto, the guy, the... Um, the sculptor who uh, is working on the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Okay. And um, so he was doing this interview with him in Manhattan. And uh, well, I met John before that, and we were chatting in the lobby. And um, he was kind of a bit disheartened with what's going on in Ireland and everything. So I was trying to cheer him up. And I was, when was this? And, this is about a year or two ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. And he, yeah, I was just, I was just trying to encourage him, look, to just keep on the battle, you know, because he's he's the main defender of of the faith in Ireland, really, one of them. And I was saying, you know, we need you to just keep keep writing because your ideas are really, really important. And um, and he was saying that he wanted to write a novel and I said, well, that's great. You should do that. And I was saying, you know, we all, cause he's a big Dylan fan. He's, you know, he's a rock journalist. Yeah. I said, you know, in the words of Bob Dylan, you know, you got to paint your masterpiece and that's what you're doing. You, this, this book that you're working on, this novel, that's really important to you. You need to do that. And, uh, and then I said to, I quoted, uh, Tarkovsky, Andre Tarkovsky about, um, Beauty is your, uh, um, what is it? What was the quote again? Art. The priest. The artist. Yeah, the priesthood. The, you know the one. The, yeah, the artist. The the art is a, is the artist the priest to beauty, the form of. Yeah, art. Artist is a priesthood, and your sacrament is beauty. Okay. Yeah. And that just hit him right between the eyes. You could see him. He was like totally blown away. And 
he was almost in tears. And then he got up and we went in and he did like this huge hall packed out. It was really, really great attendance. And he said, got up on the stage and uh, introduced um, introduced Soto. And so in his introduction, he said, uh, I was just talking to Doni. Uh, I was in the front row at that stage. And he said that Donnie, he was talking, he, 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 he quoted that. He said, uh, Donnie said this to me just a few minutes ago. And you could see Soto was like really, really taken by this, you know. And the audience were really taken by it. Because it's a really, really important um, message, you know. Because it kind of cuts right through the crap, you know. Mm-hmm. We're on a mission. This is not about us. We're, we're, we're entrusted with this sacrament. And uh, that gives us a tremendous responsibility. So it kind of takes it away from us. And puts us in a role of a priesthood, and I think that's really, really important um, because it, it helps you realise the gravity of what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And it's only when you when you realise that that you start to take it seriously, and you can overcome all the difficulties. That's true. Uh, I mean, as you know, it sometimes quite a slog. Oh yeah. Especially, especially these days, it just seems like uh, well, there's a lot of so many artists doing so many different things, and yeah, and it's it's it's, it's very easy to be distracted. Oh yeah, um, distracted um, to depressed. get uh, depressed <laughs> or not, not depressed, but you know, yeah. you feel defeated a bit. Uh, yeah, and, that, and, a, and that's a lot, why I think it's really important to. To realize that you're, you're like the battle has been won as a Christian and as a Catholic, you understand that the battle has been won or the, the war has been won. You know, Christ has redeemed us. <clears throat> uh, but we still have battles to fight, but the war is won. And uh, that helps us realize that, you know, all we have to do is stay close to Christ. All we're asked to do, in the words of St. Teresa of Calcutta, is to be faithful. God doesn't expect, to, expect us to succeed. Do you know what I mean? All we have to do is be faithful. Mm-hmm. And we're redeemed. And, and being faithful is actually succeeding. So that should take an awful lot of pressure off uh, unnecessary expectations. All you have to do is be faithful. And take all the gifts that he's given you and just maximize them in his service. Period. That's all we have to do, which is great. It's a real liberation. Mm. Um, so something like that can, can, can be very useful. Oh, are you recording yet? Or Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you are. I, I pushed the button. <laughs> <laughs> just kind of, oh, start. Oh, I didn't know we were already on. <laughs> it's okay. I told you we were just that. Um, so yeah, that's where I would be coming from. Um, well, we've kind of got deep into the the cultural stuff. Do you want to talk a little bit, maybe, about your go back to your formation as an artist? So you can sure. talk a little bit about um, that. Well, I suppose I I went to uh, I went to after high school I, I applied to New York uh, NCAD National College of Art and Design in Dublin, and that was um, uh, I failed to get in the first time, so I went to Ballyfermot Senior College, which is kind of like a, a portfolio preparation college, and that was uh, it was an animation school. A set up. Uh, it was backed up by Sol- Sullivan Bluth. They were kind of Disney people. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, and they uh, they had a lot of uh, life drawing there, so that was great because I did tons of life drawing, and life drawing really is is the source of everything I do. Um, so I learned so much there. Uh, I I learned more in one year in that kind of portfolio preparation course than I did in five years in the National College of Art and Design. <clears throat> because the National College of Art and Design is just completely taken up by gender ideology and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's even back in the 90s, you know. 
it was 1990 when I got in there. And basically it was all kind of women's studies and it was basically uh, neo-Marxism uh, uh, in the guise of feminist uh, theory. So, um, so it's, it's, that's, that's really, I, I survived about a, a two years in the fine art department. Then I got kicked out of the fine art department when it became very clear that they, that, uh, that I wasn't towing their line. The thing is, like, you could be, you could do ten times as much work as everybody else, but it doesn't matter once you're not towing and conforming to the agenda that they've set. Uh, your 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 um, your persona non grata. So basically, I transferred to the craft department, where at least I could get some of my cast, bronze cast, and so on. And then I did silver and gold work, and I graduated from that. And even that, it was quite hostile. Uh, they gave me the lowest mark possible in my graduation, um, which is like a 2-2. And uh, the irony is that the same degree show that they gave me this mark with uh, was the one that won Craft Designer of the Year Award that year <laughs> in Ireland. So, uh, uh, and they had to, the faculty had to attend that award giving ceremony, which is kind of fun. <laughs> and uh, also, also uh, I, the same degree show, because uh, it was mostly silver work that I did, uh, was selected by the National Museum of Ireland to launch the Contemporary Silver Collection. <laughs> so the faculty had to come to that award winning as well. <laughs> so uh, like the president of Ireland and everything was there so to shake hands with these people. So it's kind of, it, it, it just, it, it was really an eye opener to me after five years of absolute hell in that place and persecution of the faculty and, and their agendas, uh, because I was Christian and because I believed in beauty, I was like persona non grata. And then to actually get through all that and them messing me up as much as they could, then to actually be recognized outside as like, for the work, yeah. Here. And, and in the National Museum was like a really, uh, it, it really made things very clear to me that, wow, this, there's a really strong agenda here that doesn't recognize beauty. There, these people are ide ideologues. They're not interested in beauty. So the art school is not about art at all. It's about projecting a neo-Marxist agenda, period. And it's just using art as a means to do that. So uh, that made things very clear to me. So I spent a few years working in inner city projects, helping uh, in youth clubs and stuff like that. Uh, around a youth club for about ten years, because uh, I saw that 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 was where something where a lot of need uh, was, especially in the area of um, the crisis of paternity. Uh, these inner city kids, uh, whether they be in in inner city Dublin or in up in the Falls Road in, in, in uh, Belfast or in the Bronx, the same problem as all this uh, crisis of paternity where these kids were getting into a lot of trouble. Like the vast majority of the toxic masculinity, as they call it today, comes from a lack of fathers. So it's kind of irony, ironic that this toxic masculinity comes from a lack of fathers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if they encouraged uh, people to be uh, young men to be fathers, and to have positive masculinity, they, they, there wouldn't be so much crime. I mean, 90% of the criminals are they don't have fathers, you know, are a, a, a serious father figure in their in their lives. So, yeah, I did that for quite a while, and then um, I got it got to I was teaching in high school for a while uh, in in Dublin, and then. Um, and then I got this uh, scholarship to go to New York Academy. So I went there in 2000 and, no, that was 99. And uh, I stayed there for two years, did my master's in, in the New York Academy. Uh, that was a master's in sculpture, figure of sculpture. You studied under Eric. And that was great. You, huh? you, you're, you studied under Eric Fischel, right? Yeah, or, Eric. Or... Um, well, he was the, he was given to me as my tutor, 
Okay. Uh, I went over for Harvey Citron, actually, who's a sculptor. Uh, but I was given Eric Fischel um, instead. And I kind of, I asked if that could be changed. So, yeah, it was interesting to be with Eric in that we would have a critique every, he, you know, it'd be about a half an hour every week that we'd have a critique. But that would end up being an hour, hour and a half. Um, because generally I w would have a very different world vision than Eric and I would challenge him on his ideas. So we'd probably end up having a quite a deep uh, discussion about what, what I'm trying to do and what he's trying to do. So it was interesting that way because it gave me a really good insight into how the art world works because he's a very successful artist. Yeah, in yeah. Manhattan. And... Um, I was definitely. I was a big fan of his back in the eighties, when I was at our oh, school. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. He was huge then. Yeah. <laughs> so he kind of, um, yeah, he was kind of like a guy who brought figurative art back to the fore. Um, but it was more his world vision was very different to mine. It was his much more about the kind of the, the fallen, culture, the kind of sensual. Um, end of things, whereas I was much more interested in the, the supernatural aspect of the human person. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, he he would find that very difficult to understand. And uh, I spent a lot of time trying to explain that to him. And uh, and I would be challenging his ideas about humanity because his is much more just uh, carnal uh, um, and uh, all about kind of contemporary. Uh, Uh, contemporary self-indulgence and uh, it's, it's, it's it was kind of it was kind of depressing stuff for me really I found this work very uh, very uh, sad in many ways so uh, so it was interesting to to, to, to experience his uh, his, his his understandings and to be able to understand the art world through his eyes and because I remember having a number of discussions with them like about what I was trying to do. And he said, oh, you're, I know plenty of Catholic artists. Well, what about uh, the different guy? Is it Serrano, the guy who did the Piss Christ? He put oh, the, the Christ <laughs> back the You know, and I said, Eric, you don't get it. I mean, that's not that's not Catholic art. That's, that's anti-Catholic art, you know. And he says, well, what about, you know, the, uh, the Chris Offley who did the the virgin with all the porn, porn images and the elephant shit. And I said, <laughs> I don't think you get the idea. And then, so he went out to lunch. He said, uh, look, we'll catch up after lunch. So he went out to lunch and he came back and he said, you won't believe who I met at lunch. And he said, uh, so who is this? You know, the, the one who did the last supper, the photographer did the last supper, uh, photograph with all the naked women instead of the apostles and and Christ, I said, oh yeah, yeah, right, pretty good. Yeah, I, I told her about you and your what you're trying to do, and and I invited her up to meet you and discuss. I thought it would be really interesting, but she declined. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you did not get it. You know, this, this this is precisely what I'm saying. These people are not on the same page. You know, uh, I'm trying to celebrate the beauty of the Christian vision, and these people are are trying to. They're just using it to shock and, and get attention. It's a very different approach. Anyway, so obviously I wasn't really getting through. Um, uh, and it was very clear from that experience that I knew that the New York art scene would be impossible to navigate uh, as an authentic Christian and artist, you know. So that's why I, I kind of found my own audience and... Um, and uh, and serve them through my work, mainly liturgical art and sacred art, because these are the things I value. I much prefer to do a statue of Saint Joseph than Obama, you know, or Hillary Clinton. You know, the, these are, you know, I I prefer to celebrate these 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 virtues and uh, and these great people, uh, so as to help. Uh, okay, oh, cool. to create a new, a new, 
iconography of, of Christianity for a contemporary audience. So for instance, St. Joseph was a good example of where I could take um, a saint and use this 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 iconography to um, to address contemporary issues like the crisis of paternity, for instance. Okay. So yeah, yeah. I, I took the image of Saint Joseph and um, and I ma and I made him much more in, 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 much more masculine and uh, and more uh, compassionate also. So holding the child and kissing the child. So there's that paternal aspect, but also. He's, he's very vir virile and attractive. So I wanted to, and not like an old man, like most of these depictions of St. Joseph, I made him a young man, inspired by St. Escriva, the founder of Opus Dei. So as to create a, an icon of St. Joseph that young men could identify with and say, yeah, I want to be like that guy. I want to be fit, attractive, and looking after my child. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and not like this, this, uh, like the old iconography of this uh, dried up old man, you know, with the <laughs> in a toga, you know, it's, it's, it, it doesn't relate to young people today. Um, so it's, it's important to, to, to continue that iconography and to contribute to it as a contemporary artist. Um, so things like that were a lot of fun. Yeah. Working, um, in line with tra tradition, but using yeah, yeah. Um, today's kind of imagery. Yeah, yeah, I was very much inspired by Cardinal Ratzinger's ideas in spirit liturgy, um, where he talks about forward in tradition, going forward yes. in tradition. Yeah, think... and, and that and that's the that's the title, subtitle of the school I founded in Florence, um, the Sacred Art School of Firenze, forward in tradition. Uh, the whole idea was to to take to steep yourself in the tradition, and then to bring it forward. So you'd have um, things like, um, like uh, I, it was, that was from my own experience. Like the the art school I went to, I was kicked out of. Like that was going forwards without tradition. Uh, that was uh, so. That's very easy to go forward without tradition because you don't have to understand the past like I learned nothing about Bernini or Michelangelo or any of these guys in, yeah. in art school <laughs> so so they're going forward without tradition and it's easy to do that and it's also easy to go backwards in tradition you just steep yourself in tradition and stay there it's nice and comfortable but the real challenge is to steep yourself in tradition and have the courage to move forward that means you have to really listen to history, listen to the environment, listen to the world, listen uh, and really penetrate it deeply, and then have the courage to bring that forward. And that's very difficult because you have to take the whole weight of your tradition, lift it up on your shoulders, and then bring it forward. And that's it's in that tension, it's in that struggle that real cultural transformation happens. Um, or you and could I don't use... believe in. Yeah. Sorry, you could use the old saying: "Stand it." You could stand on the shoulders of giants and go yeah, that much very further. Much same, yeah, it's very, very much in the same um, in the same light. I think so. That, that that's where I'd be coming from. So forward in tradition, um, and and you can see that it's very similar to the spiritual life as well. Uh, you have a fallen nature, and you're aspiring. Uh, for the divine you want to move you want to move up towards so you have a fallen nature which is inclining you towards sin and then you have uh, uh, a, a, a divine calling we're called to be saints as christ asks us on saint paul you're you're we're called to perfection we're called to be saints so we're aspiring to the divine but we have a fallen nature and it's in that tension that uh, the human person is really projected the fullness of the human person we're called to life life in the full and that's and that's love love calls us to the full perfection of the human person so that's uh it challenging your fallen nature by aspiring towards the divine it's in that tension that that happens and that's what sanctity is and i see art in a very similar guise that do we have a, a tradition 
and it needs to be understood and brought forward. And it's in that tension that great art can be produced. And that's where, if we look at the history of art and any 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 cultural advance, it all happens in that area where there's a full penetration and a, a transformation and a tension. And it's that tension that makes this work really, really interesting. All you have to do is look at uh, an artist like Michelangelo, and you can see even both. You can see this personal struggle, fallen nature, aspiring to the divine, but also a full penetration of the culture and the history of the Greek and Roman architecture and, and, and art, and he transforms it within a Christian context. And I think that's one of the reasons why I think the Renaissance is so fascinating. It's because you get that tension. You have this full penetration of Greco-Roman culture, Greek exterior beauty, uh, you know, the architecture and the, and the human body, Roman interior psychology of like the portraiture of the Roman, uh, you know, second century BC. Uh, uh, and uh, so you have that, that, and then the interior of the basilicas, that, that, that interest in the interior again. And so the interior psychology of the Romans, exterior beauty of the Greeks. And when that's combined with the, uh, with the interior spirituality of, uh, of Christianity, you get this full flowering of the human condition. You have the exterior beauty, interior psychology, and Christian spirituality. Well, you get the, I think, the fullness of Western man, really. The... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's the reason why the Renaissance is so important. And from that, we get... Uh, Michelangelo, Raphael, and, and Leonardo, you know, uh, who really helped to launch this and bring us Titian and Velasquez and Caravaggio. And, and, yeah. Caravaggio, yeah, yeah. So I think it, 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 it's only, like, I, I understand these things through experience, through copying these paintings, through composing work myself, uh, and and it's, it's, it's through engaging in this this conversation with the masters over periods of time, that you start to understand these things. So it's not it's not necessarily learned from a book. These are this this is learned from the book of beauty, uh, <laughs> the the actual dialogues with these great masters. And this is something I really appreciate when I'm copying paintings in the National Gallery in DC or here in Dublin. When you're painting inside the gallery with your canvas on a on a, on, a, on a tripod and you're just working away and you're having a deeper and deeper and deeper conversation with these great masters in the presence of the masterpiece itself. I mean, it's just, it's, it's such a beautiful opportunity. And this is what you learn from those conversations. And I think this is really important to pass on to, to the general public so that they can actually re-engage with these works of art uh, in, the, in their fullness. So at what point did you, you move to Florence around 2001? I think that's when we met. Yeah, Florence, I moved to, no, I moved to Rome in 2001. So I was in Rome for okay. a year and a half. And um, I was working on a number of projects. Yeah, it was essentially, essentially what happened um, is uh, just two months before September 11, 2001, when the when the towers came down, uh, I was in New York. So for the two months previous to that, so that was a very difficult time because I, uh, I was helping these kids in the Bronx and one of their fathers, uh, did, uh, two of those kids, their father uh, committed suicide in front of them and I was trying to help them. He was an NYT PD cop. Uh, and I was trying to help those kids uh, deal with that. And uh, shortly after that, uh, the, uh, a neighbor of mine committed suicide upstairs uh, the, the apartment above me in Queens and then the neighborhood burnt down in Queens uh, what? what what happened it was a it was a, it was a, a chip pan fire I think in in the local restaurant okay so the like the whole everywhere I went the old local pub everything was destroyed and then the school burnt down uh, three weeks after that uh, the New York Academy. Um, so there was a really tragic kind of period, but um, the two two of the firemen that rescued my stuff from the school 
uh, were killed in September 11, two weeks after that, because uh, we were right beside the towers. So uh, it was really when September 11 happened, I realized, oh my God, this is uh, time, my time. Has time to, here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because uh, like, everything I knew was just completely imploding. Um, so I, and it was kind of a traumatic period. So I went back to Ireland uh, to get a bit of, um, uh, get, get my head together. And once I arrived, uh, my brother picked me up at the airport with very bad news. He said, oh, yeah, what's, what? I so he told me, he showed me the newspaper that day. And um, a mutual friend of ours just killed his wife, two kids, and tried to commit suicide. And oh, jeez. So, yeah, I say, oh my God, this is, like I thought I was getting away from this shit. So um, I visited him in, house, in, in prison and uh, that was pretty traumatic. Um, and after that, shortly after that, I went to Rome because I got a tip off to do a, a five meter marble for St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, so I went to Rome to try and get that gig. I didn't get it. But while I was there, I uh, drew the Pietà in St. Peter's. Uh, over three weeks, I spent a week on each drawing, one full frontal and then one from the side and another from another side. And during that, I uh, I really learned a hell of a lot about who about my my humanity and it it kind of it was kind of like a healing experience. After all that trauma, uh, I had such a crisis of faith and of of my of humanity my, my 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 faith in humanity my faith in god my faith in my religion everything was kind of very severely challenged and during that three week contemplation and meditation on the suffering of christ and his mother in the pieta completely healed me it renewed my faith in god in humanity and in my vocation as an artist yeah. uh, well that's quite I realized Michelangelo, yeah, Michelangelo yeah. healed me through that that block of stone, marble. It's it's quite astonishing, and and that that just uh, blew my mind, and and that was really where my vocation really as an artist became consolidated, because I knew that if I can just scratch the surface of Michelangelo, if I can bring just a tiny bit of that forward, then I've achieved something great in that if this work of his can heal my humanity with the beauty and love that he put into that work, uh, inspired by Christ and his mother, then uh, I could do that in my own work and I could be able to heal the world through my own work. Uh, and that's what gave me the, the impetus to move forward. And it has been the main purpose of my life ever since. Um, I suppose also in the New York Academy, I discovered the theology of the body because I was doing this uh, crucifix in the New York Academy. Um, and I decided to do it in bones and muscles so as to, uh, to use this newfound vocabulary of artistic anatomy to challenge my faith in a way to ask myself do i really believe that god became man that this figure on this cross is actually god and by contemplating the bones and muscles of jesus christ crucified on the cross i would engage in the incarnation in my primary grammar which is form uh, so it was a purely uh, a personal exploration and contemplation of my faith within a, within this new form, newfound uh, artistic grammar, and uh, that was an amazing exploration and discovery for me personally. But it also helped me to realize um, through actually a priest who visited me, Father Bob Connors, a very good friend. He uh, he saw he saw my crucifix in, the, in, the, in in my studio in, in Tribeca, and he said, "What you have done here is very similar to John Paul II's theology of the body." 
Uh, I said, theology of the what? I said, it's theology <laughs> of the body, yeah. It's, it's, it's this really amazing idea that, that John Paul has, has uh, helped to, to people to understand. And it's basically this, this uh, understanding of the, of the body as a theology, that, that we can understand God through our body. And our body is designed as a gift. And, uh, and that's how we relate to each other as a gift. And how God relates to us as a gift, and uh, it's it's really phenomenal. That that was the most transforming uh, document of my life is the theology of the Bible because it gave me an understanding of who I am and what I'm designed for, um, and I suppose that really profoundly influenced my work. Uh, you know, because it, it helped me understand my faith in in a in a in a, in a very carnal way. Which is very helpful uh, as a figurative artist to be able to see a theology in the body. So when a, when a model is on a stand in front of me, it's not a it's not a lump of flesh. It's actually a whole theological and philosophical understanding of the human condition sitting in front of me. And if I can unpack that as an artist, then I can enter into the depths of my humanity and their humanity and the humanity of everybody through drawing, painting, and sculpting. So it's extraordinary liberation uh, and, and a discovery for me. So I shared this with the other students in the New York Academy, and they were really excited about this because these are like some of the most talented artists from all over the world coming to this school in Manhattan. And they're learning everything about the human body except what it means. What it means, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, this was like amazing. So, the, like, uh, I started uh, unpacking the theology of the body with all these students in the school, and my studio was packed every Friday night. I did it every Friday night. We started at eight o'clock, and these discussions would go on till three o'clock in the morning in the bars of Soho, uh, discussing theology of the body. It's just fascinating stuff. So, I taught that for on a weekly basis for the next twenty years, and uh, it's it's helped transform so many people. It's been a real eye opener, and some people who have majorly challenged uh, sexual issues have been transformed by this this theology of the body because it just unpacks the truth and meaning of human sexuality as an icon of love. It's it's absolutely mind blowing stuff, and um, so I thoroughly recommend it to artist or non artist. Yeah, you were the so one that, that introduced uh, it to me as well. In oh the, yeah, was that in, in the uh, studio in Florence? Florence. Yeah. Mm. Mm. The um, we had those meetings in the Anagoni room. Do you remember? Oh yes, yeah. In San Marco, yeah, yeah, yeah. right there uh, beside Beato Angelico studio. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and you think of all the people that came to the faith through that, uh, like uh, Cody, it must and be Sam. Yeah, yeah, it's just amazing. Uh, it's, it's, it's it must be twelve guys up to, uh, to date now have been brought to the faith through theology of the body and have been baptized by the Cardinal Archbishop of Florence and uh, and in the last one was there is Mark he was baptized in London there uh, only a year ago so you know there's so many artists are coming to the faith through the theology of the body because when you start to unpack art in its full theological context they, they just have to, um, some of these are Taiwanese and Japanese artists. That's like, like no uh, connection with Western philosophy or theology before, but once they understand it through theology of the body, they're just transformed. It's because it's an international language, the body. Yeah. <laughs> so these are the things that uh, inspire me. I just popped into my head this idea of uh, it's kind of connected the international language, this idea of logos as well mm. as being an international um, thing. It's not something that's tied to any culture, right? It's uh, yeah. Yeah. And that's very, it's very much, uh, but it's very much tied to the incarnation. I mean, Christ is the logos. Uh, and that's one thing I kind of discovered when I went to Florence initially, I was struck by, you know, three of the prominent uh, expat art schools in, in Florence were like, 
uh, you know, the Florence Academy of Art, Charles Cecil Academy, the John Angel Academy, and all these three guys used to work together. Um, uh, they were all one school initially, and then they broke up and they had their own techniques. So one uses site size, the other uses comparative measurement. So it's kind of like different tools. Slightly different tools, don't overlap for sure. But Oh yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. But um, I found that, you know, it, it, it seemed a bit strange to me that, you know, one, was speci one school specialized in spanners, the other specialized in screwdrivers, the other specialized in sledgehammers, or, you know, <laughs> like, the, the, why, why not have them all, uh, all the tools that you can have and not separate, you know? Um, so I, I, I did a documentary on, on the three of them. Um, and then I tried to bring them together to discuss it, but there wasn't any, any uh, they weren't interested in discussing it, which, which, I, which I thought was a shame because all the students wanted them to come together and, and discuss uh, their, their, their visions, artistic visions. Yeah, that would I have been fascinating. Would be, I mean... Wouldn't it have been a fantastic yeah. culmination to a documentary? Um, but unfortunately they weren't, but that's, uh, everybody has their own thing. But uh, that's one of the reasons I felt inspired. Well, I was I was asked by Cardinal Archbishop of Florence to to start an art school. He he visited my studio uh, in San Marco. The Dominicans gave me Beato Angelico studio for about two years, and through that, a number of people were baptized. Uh, and the Archbishop asked if he could. Um, he, he visited the studio, so he visited the studio, and in the visit, during the visit, he asked me to start uh, a diocesan school of art in Florence, so the Sacred Art School Firenze, which I founded in 2011, um, and still running, thank God. Uh, but that was that was uh, something that really came from from the from the necessity to to bring forward this tradition because the the Cardinal Archbishop Bittori saw that this art was bringing people to the faith and uh, people from vastly different cultures and he wanted this to uh, to be consolidated in in, a, in an institution like the Sacred Art School of Firenze so I was glad to do that and that's something that I'm hoping to do maybe in the States now uh, soon is to establish something like that in the States and then create a bridge between um, a sacred art school in maybe New York City to um, a sacred art school in Florence. Because everybody in Florence wants to be in New York City and everybody <laughs> in New York City wants to be in Florence. Of course. So, uh, <laughs> nobody wants to be where they're at. So... Um, I think it could be a really interesting um, forward and backwards from the United States to Europe, uh, and in in within that, uh, a really profound cultural transformation could could occur. Uh, so that's something I'm working on at the moment. Well, that's a pretty interesting project. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's again, it's kind of like. A, Another another idea from Carl Ratzinger is you know continuity, not rupture. I I believe in continuity. I believe that you know you need to move forward and and produce uh, and be productive about uh, understanding your history and your 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 uh, journey and try and make it uh, continuous and progressive, rather than to have a rupture between you know. Uh, an Irish period and a Florentine period and a, an American period. Now, I want them all to work together because I, re I, I know that my life has a purpose and I want to bring them all together. And this way I can kind of sew all the pieces together. So it's kind of like uh, you heard the, probably heard the expression sewing without thread. You know, you're just going through the motions and nothing's pulled together. Yeah. I think it's really important. <laughs> So with tread. So if you're going to make that journey, try and pull it together. And that's what I'm trying to do at the moment is to try and see the trajectory of my life and my work and see how that can pull together to consolidate in something of substance that can go forward in the future and serve our culture in, in the future years. 
That's definitely a big uh, project. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, well, the thing is, uh, the reason I'm doing it is because I know it's not me who's doing it. I, if, if I, if I re like, I'm just a tool uh, to do this, uh, an instrument, and a very basic instrument. And that's the way I believe God works. He uses the most humble tools to achieve the most amazing things. And, and I think he does that for many reasons. He does it because uh, he wants people to know that he is doing this work, not me. And also, uh, it helps people realize that, you know, it saves people become getting a big head and thinking that they're doing marvelous things when actually God is quite obviously doing the marvelous thing and you're just mm -hmm. participating. And that's what I mean by faithfulness. Uh, God doesn't expect success. He expects faithfulness. And, you know, in the words of Mother Teresa, and I think it's very, very true. And that takes a hell of a lot of pressure off you. <laughs> It means you can enjoy what you're doing without worrying about it. You know, you just, you just, you're just doing it because this is what you've been given, um, and you enjoy it. And I, I don't, I don't, I don't. I'm not intimidated by anything. I just get on with it, and it liberates you from all that nonsense. Well, yeah, you can't, uh, <clears throat> you can't spend time thinking about things too long. You just have to work and hopefully. Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, the the artist's primary responsibility is to listen. Listen with your eyes and really <laughs> penetrate, really, really penetrate uh, your existence. And uh, through that conversation with nature and that conversation with the masters, that great ideas can be born and great work can be born. And that's where really true beauty comes from. Who do you look at uh, currently as far as an artist? For artists, um, who have I looking for? I, I'd be at the moment. I, I've I've been co I'm copying quite a bit of Ribera. I've, I'm sitting in front of a, a Ribera copy I did here in um, the uh, National Gallery in Dublin. Here, um, uh, Luca Giordano and uh, Soroya, Pontormo, El Greco. So I'm cop uh, copying from all these guys at the moment. Um, and then doing a lot of work from life and personal compositions. I did the death of my father as well. Um, so that was based on a photograph actually, but uh, um, my brother's an amazing photographer, Paul McManus, paulmcmanus.com. So he's got a webpage <laughs> as well. And he's, um, yeah, he took this photograph of my dad when he just died, uh, of us all re reacting to it. It's almost like a Caravaggio painting. It's like the death of the Virgin, you know, uh, or Domitian of the Virgin should be correctly uh, titled. And that, um, yeah, so uh, that inspired that painting. So uh, that's that's the piece I'm working on. Um, also, at the moment, I've just started a new commission. It's an 11 foot uh, sculpture of um, St. Oliver Plunkett for Armagh Cathedral here in Ireland. Um, the Primate of All Ireland, Archbishop Eamon Martin commissioned this. So that's, um, I'm, I'm doing that in my backyard at the moment. And uh, hopefully another uh, commission for Longford here, another three figure bronze um, uh, will be uh, started soon. So that's the kind of stuff I'm working on at the moment. You're not doing, any, not, you're not doing any teaching, right? Right now? No, I'm not really doing any teaching. Uh, it's mainly commissions and uh, documentaries. So uh, I, I did, I should, uh, a crew came over from LA to Dublin during the summer uh, and they did uh, a documentary on my work and uh, my vision and then I I've done two documentaries since then in Italy one on Florence and another on Rome and I'm going to shoot another one in next month uh, in Florence on a sculpture of mine in Florence uh, it's uh, it's ba it's basically inspired by Theology of the Body, actually, I designed it when I went to move to Rome in 2001. 
and it is uh, I enlarged it in Florence in 2010. And then uh, when I left Florence, uh, I basically made a mold of it and it's in storage. And uh, I would like to realize that in bronze as a fountain of life. It's inspired by um, Humana Vitae uh, and Theology of the Body. And uh, that's a piece I want to, to develop. So there's a, a team wants to do a documentary on that so as to uh, bring it out in public so that people know this piece and that it can be commissioned and realized. So one of the one of the big challenges as a sculptor is the you know the size like I've spent of my own money over 20,000 euro of my own money on this sculpture. So it's two life two twice life size figures uh with the skeleton and child and everything involved so it's, it's a massive composition uh and it's cost me all this money in mold making and storage and so on yeah <laughs> so that's coming out of my own pocket you know what i mean so i'm i'm over twenty thousand uh euro in debt over this sculpture just to keep it alive uh in storage so uh, in order to realize this vision, uh, we're going to do this documentary and, and hopefully get people to fund the making of this and uh, stop and have me not paying out more uh, money to keep the thing alive. I want to give birth to this piece. It's almost like it's almost come to full term. It's a very long pregnancy, put it that way. <laughs> uh, so once it's born, then I can uh, stop pumping out money to keep it alive. So the plan will be to, to have them document the whole process of it being sculpted, made? Well, yeah, it's, it's good. I suppose the, it would be a documentary. I would tell the story of where the piece comes from, you know, where the idea comes from, um, where I made it, and uh, you know, photographs of it being made and so on. And then uh, the of of the moles in the foundry and telling the story about the piece and then uh, explaining how we would like to realize the piece and um, uh, maybe have a cast in Florence and shipped to the States. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's in the making. We still have to work out how, how is best to, to communicate. It's kind of a strange, uh, documentary in that it's it's about a piece that is not born yet <laughs> uh, so it's, it's kind of an interesting insight into the creative process uh, usually documentaries are about artworks that are already being realized but this is not actually realized yet it's, it has been realized in clay but it hasn't been realized in its final um, material which is which is bronze and has a fountain and this the like the the, the whole composition is about it's a, it's about it's 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 inspired by humana vitae which means on human life and it's probably the most uh, controversial uh, document in church history uh, certainly recent church history because it is the document which uh, states the church's position on um, on on uh, the transmission of life and in particular uh, contraception and the importance of of uh, the truth and meaning of human sexuality and and uh, so it and it's it, theology of the body is basically an ample explanation of the church's stance on uh, human sexuality human sexuality and the truth and meaning of it. So the piece is basically two figures spiraling around each other uh, and holding up a child. Uh, and so it's on our website. You can see it. Uh, don't yeah, I'm familiar with the piece. I mean, I'm familiar with the, yeah. the, the clay sketch for sure. And even yeah. you had it partially realized in, is that the one you're talking about? The one that's like... In Florence? Yeah. yeah it was full. Yeah, it was, it was full, full scale. Yeah. It was like it's, twice life size. Yeah. Is that still? So in... I, I I finished that in Florence, but then I made a mold of it, so it's all it's oh, okay. in a mold now. Okay. Uh, so I have photographs 
uh, of that, and that's on my web page, so you can see that on DonnyMcManus.com. And um, so it's basically two figures spiraling around each other, and there's a child at the top and there's a skeleton at the bottom. The child is pulling the figures up, and the skeleton is pulling the figures down. So it's the culture of life and the culture of death. And it's 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 a very powerful image, if I don't mind saying myself, because it's it's uh, anybody who has seen it, whether it's a child or a person who has no education whatsoever in, in the arts, come in and they know exactly what it says and what it means, uh, which is which means a lot to me because it it means that the piece is actually communicating without me actually having to say anything. Yeah. When you see it, you'll understand that the piece is about the culture of life and the culture of death, and it all happens within the tension uh, between a man and a woman's heart and the love between a man and a woman. Because if that love is good, true, and beautiful, it will lead to life and love. And if it's not good, true, and beautiful, it will be dragged down towards death and decay and violence. And that's really what's happening in our culture today. We have this culture of life in tension with a culture of death. And I wanted to illustrate this in this piece so as to make it very clear the tensions that our world is living through right now. And it all happens in the human heart. So it kind of, uh, it, it calls us to personal responsibility in many ways. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to externalize evils. Uh, like you see in Islam, they have the tradition of throwing the stone at the pillar in in in, in uh, Mecca, because the pillar symbolizes the evil, and they throw the stones at the at the, at the pillar. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's the same reason why in they throw the, the stoning of of uh, of a woman caught in adultery, uh, as you see in the old Hebrew or in in Islamic culture. Uh, it's that's ex again externalizing the sin, but actually, what's the real sin is in the interior heart of the man who lusts at the woman. <laughs> so, uh, so what I'm trying to do is in this piece is to clarify that you know the evils that we see in the world come from the human heart, and if we can purify our heart and our intentions and learn to love with purity. Uh, then we can heal the world. So the, the world is only healed by our heart and our own transformation. And if we can transform ourselves, then we can transform the world around us. Um, so that's what it's about, because so, most people like to externalize that. You can also see that in like uh, socialism and communism, it's kind of like it's, 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 you have to change the society and the society is, you know, you know, the, the, the government will control and change everything. No, no, it's the personal responsibility. It's subsidiarity, which is the, which is the Catholic uh, idea of, 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 of transforming culture from, from, from the person and the family. So that the basic nucleus is what, where decisions should be made. And the human person should make the decisions, the human family should make decisions for their families. The, the parents are the primary educators of their children. These are really important concepts. It's a, yeah, it's an interesting that, concept because it comes back to what we talked about at the beginning when what can um, a person do in this culture where everything, it seems so overwhelming that there's so many negative forces at play. You know, it comes back yeah. to what is change, just work on yourself, change yourself. Yeah. I mean, if you want to change the world, change yourself. It's 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 really, and you know the old expression when you point your finger, the three fingers pointing back at you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it's 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 a really good anatomical reminder of uh, what a dumbass we can be. Yeah. <laughs> or was you know, the thing that... <laughs> Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, I think it, I think it's it's a very it's a very good reminder that we shouldn't point our fingers because those three fingers are pointing back at us. Yeah. And what you see out there, you need to three times transform within yourself. Yeah, that, uh, that question, what's wrong with the world? Well, me. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So true. <laughs>